Hello and welcome to TIS Today, EVE Online. So this is the EVE Online report for September 16th, 2020. I am Matterall, here with Gregorin. How are you doing, Gregorin? I'm all right. How are you? Good. Maddox are, may be in in just a few minutes. He's running a bit late. Um, so this is our daily show about EVE Online news. And we're going to start with some statistics. Then we'll go into a lot of the news that came out of CCP today. A lot of game news. The Capsalia Redemption program. Upcoming Abyssal Proving Ground events. And Rolling Thunder. New updates coming on the 22nd of September. Then we'll roll into some player news. I want to look at some articles actually this week. Uh, Noisy Gamer put an MER uh, monthly economic report article out that's worth looking at. Uh, also, I want to look at uh, some statistics about EVE Online players. How many people play EVE Online? Because I found a site that says about half a million subscribers. wonder if that shocks people. Uh, also want to look at an INN article, The Rhetoric of War, Double-Edged Sword by Sierra Lucille. Uh, kind of interesting article there with beautiful artwork by Major Sniper. I consider a protege uh, as far as art goes, but he's a master on his own now. And then we'll turn to the war report. I think we're at day 72. And some big news came out of the initiative today, or actually it came out yesterday, but it was after our last program. Uh, leadership update number 74, stare down your masters. I wonder what he's trying to say. We'll find out as we get to that section. We also want to look at more articles, this time not from EVE players or fans, but from Polygon. And there was an article that came out uh, yesterday that we didn't get to, uh, featuring Vili and the Mitanni locked in this death grips uh, over this war. So we'll check that out. And finally, the, some uh, Prometheus went down and Dracos. Uh, Fortizara went down. Those are two faction Fortizara's inquiries belonging to Goon Swarm. We'll have a look at those and some killboards. Okay, let's uh, jump in. Case-by-case uh, case judgments is what's called for in the redemption program. Uh, let's bring that up on screen for you. This was a surprise. Uh, the Capsule Redemption Program by CCP. Did you have a look at this, Gregorin? It's, uh, it's uh, uh, reviewing some of the banned players. Yeah, I... I don't know if they're, uh, what they're trying to do. Okay, so for a few years, actually, there's a lot to this, actually. Um, and I don't know how much history to go into. But about two years ago, there was this uh, group of game gamer companies that basically said, enough is enough. We're allowing way too much bad behavior in this virtual environment, these video games. So let's come together and create a society where we, we can set some standards on how people should behave. So that was a couple of years ago. And you had uh, groups like, I believe, Riot Games was a co-signer of that. And uh, so they signed up for this kind of a pledge as uh, CCP signed up for this pledge as a gaming company that wanted to be more responsible at how they let people behave in their video games. And so from that came a new behavioral policy, which had a zero tolerance for certain times, uh, certain types of abuse. And funny enough, right after they signed that, and I mean like days or maybe a couple weeks after they signed that and made a big uh, PR push on it, that's when GigX uh, was caught threatening the judge in uh, the corp channel that, that uh, they had in game. And that was streamed out by, I think, Jay Amazingness from Goonswarm, completely cementing GigX's fate. And GigX at that point had threatened the judge. Uh, he did it in the game, so it was within the domain of CCP. Uh, and it had been broadcast through streaming to the rest of the world, the rest of the player base which now knew, and there was no way to hide it. So there was this uh, immediate call for GigX to be banned, and within hours he was. In fact, we were on the show live with him. He was on our show uh, when he was banned, and when he got the letter saying, you're now banned from the game, and it's been a permanent ban since then. And GigX is so important to Circle of Two, his alliance, that that really spelled the end for Circle of Two. There been attempts to kind of keep it going, but that didn't uh, work out. So uh, all that was very interesting. And that's kind of a backdrop to what had happened at the time. So 
This comes two years after that era of zero tolerance. And CCP is saying, well, we want to have a redemption program to let some people that got banned uh, because they, they were over emotional at a certain moment. We want to give them a chance to come back. Now, we don't know uh, Gig X's case in specific at all, what's going to happen there, if he's going to be allowed to appeal his ban or not. But he is the highest profile ban as he sits outside the game. A lot of people want him back in, especially guys that were inside of his alliance. Uh, and this might be that little window that's needed. But let's go into this. So this starts out with, uh, Dear Capsuleers, in September 2018, we updated our real-life harassment and threats policy and introduced a zero-tolerance approach to dealing with these issues. After two years, this zero-tolerance policy, uh, sorry, with this zero-tolerance policy, there have been instances whose outcome did not reflect the good intentions we envisioned uh, when we first implemented the policy. So... Here's where it gets interesting. One of the pillars, and this I'm quoting again from the article, one of the pillars of the of Eve is that while New Eden is cruel, it is also fair. We want our in-game policies to reflect fairness and, in the same way that Capsuleers do not have only one life, those Eve players who have violated some of our policies should not always be subject to our harshest punishment at one strike. And I think that's very interesting. I'll go on just a little bit longer here. In the spirit of reflecting, learning, and growth, we have decided to evolve our policy. Effective immediately, we will be subjecting future alleged violations of these policies to a case-by-case -case review and reducing the absolute policy of permabanning on a first offense. And that's the crux of it. So some of the things, so that's very, as they're lightening up on their uh, zero tolerance ban on the first uh, error, uh, except that there will be some areas where they will not uh, reconsider and we'll go down to these. So expressly prohibited and will still result, result in a permaban, serious, targeted, incredible personal harassment or doxing, real life money trading or botting, Extreme and repeated racism or hate speech. Serious in-game exploit abuse. And finally, other serious and malicious activities included in the real-life harassment policy. And that just means that they can permaban you uh, for anything that's in that real-life harassment policy. But they definitely will ban you for the stuff listed above. What do you think of that, Gregorian? Yeah, well, I think that uh Gigax did step out of line he probably he probably d does is one of the people who I would allow back into the game if I was CCP why i mean he, I, I can see a lot of people getting similarly heated if you put them most people in the shoes of someone who just saw what he'd spent 10 years building up destroyed by someone who he had trusted. Mm. So you think that the uh, offense against him was so big that his reaction was within measure of uh, what had been done to him? I think he stepped out of line, but I think that it's so a reaction that a lot of other people would have had if they were in the this same position. Yeah. Well, okay. Thanks for your opinion. Um, I think that'll be an area of a lot of discussion. We did reach out to GigX for comments, and at this point, he has no comment, but he is aware of the, the new policy. There's one other thing. People cannot petition for anyone, so there shouldn't... Um, you shouldn't think that you can uh, create a campaign to free somebody like a GigX, for instance, or anybody else. We're picking we're picking GigX as, as an example because he's the highest profile example that we have. But there are other people that were banned. Some people think unfairly. Um, so the only person that has any agency in this is the person that was banned, him or herself. They're the only ones that can appeal. 
Okay, so that is the Capsuleer Redemption Program. What do we think of the actual, and I'm inviting chat to, uh, to add to this, what do we think of this actual um, loosening up on the uh, banning, uh, zero tolerance banning, uh, permaban on the first offense? Uh, let us know. Come talking in stations and talk about it. Okay, so we'll move on then to the next one. This is the next uh, Proving Grounds. And let's see, this looks like three new events coming. The first one, uh, first of all, those that aren't familiar with Proving Grounds, this is basically gladiator combat that you can join in at any time. You get a filament from a station, which you can buy, and they're really cheap. You can also find them or loot them or get hold of them, uh, but you can buy them. And with those filaments, uh, they're essentially something you throw on the ground and you step into it and it takes you somewhere. And these filaments will take you into an arena where you can fight uh, with very cheap ships. Of course, you have to have your own ship. You get your own ship and then you go into this arena and you compete. And there's some prizes and there's also a leaderboard. So from the, I believe right now, they're having uh, gladiator fights for frigates and uh Duo, I think it's duo destroyers going on right now. So maybe two destroyers. Uh, so find a friend and go in with a friend, or you can dual box if you can. But uh, on the 18th, this will change to, on September 18th, this will change to a four player T1 cruiser free for all. That means you go in by yourself and you face off with three other cruisers, and best of luck. Also on the, and that goes until the 22nd. So that's on the 18th. On the 25th, you will have 1v1 T1 cruiser, sorry, T1 combat and Navy faction frigates. That's these here. So a Punisher, Tormentor, Merlin, these are all frigates. And you can use a, a Navy issue, which is kind of cool. Those are a little more powerful. Uh, you can see here like a uh, Federation Navy comment or a Mollus Navy issue, a Republic Fleet Fire Tail, a Vigil Fleet issue, a uh, Griffin, Griffin Navy issue, and of course the Hook Bill. That's the Kaldari Hook Bill. So that will be really interesting. I think you'll see some expensive frigates in that fight. That's on the 25th of this month. I know which ship you will not be seeing at all. The Griffin Navy issue. Why is that? Uh, so these are 1v1, right? Yeah. Because of the ECM issues, it's one of its main things does not work at all against a single opponent. Oh, interesting. Uh, some kind of electronic warfare that does not work on a single opponent yeah, so, will do you uh, no good? ECM... The because after ECM got changed, I guess uh, two years ago, I think uh, it's it prevents the target from targeting anything but the person using ECM. And if that person that ship is the only target available, it's useless. Right. Okay. So watch your electronic warfare choices. Okay. Again, that is the uh, T1 combat. And Navy faction frigate. So that's a basically faction frigate uh, 1v1s. And that's September 25th. Then in October 2nd, we have the 2v2 T1 cruisers. They did a little misspelling there. I won't tell them if you uh, uh, don't mind. Uh, but yeah, so that's 2v2 cruisers, T1 cheap ships. That looks like a lot of fun. I believe that's what they started with when this whole... Uh, proving ground started so that makes a return so three I'm new pretty sure it was yeah it was right so three new arenas uh, for you guys all month and that's the abyssal proving grounds you can get into it by buying filaments in the marketplace okay um our last piece of this is a big one a very big one this is called uh, Rolling Thunder, and I believe it has some Black Ops changes. We'll have a look at those. Yeah, yeah Black Ops, Fax, and Eden Comp ships, I think. Rolling Thunder. You want to tell us about Rolling Thunder? Yeah. I, I mostly saw some ship rebounds changes, like Black Ops battleships are getting uh, a... a 
resistance bonus, for example, and this is uh, really a good change because recently they had mostly been relegated to the role of bridging ship for uh, tr for uh, cruiser and stealth bomber fleets because they haven't really been cost effective if you put them on grid with the the target okay so giving them a, a a little bit of extra tank will make them more useful so that people might actually drop them on grid a bit more yeah they'll actually use them I, I am not that familiar with Black Ops anymore. I uh, might have tinkered with them a long, long time ago. I think the Sin was a ship that I wanted to get into a fairly long time ago. Um, and I don't think I ever really used it except to bridge. Um, but there was I, I was friends with a lot of blo Blopsers or Black Ops. And uh, they used to do a lot of like chaining where they where one Black Ops would bring all the other Black Ops with them. And, uh, and they would only fight with Black Ops, although they were, they had to have a certain amount. You had a five or six uh, battleships because these things would get destroyed quick. They were like glass cannons, so you needed enough to really project damage and destroy your target before they could fire back on you guys. Uh, so yeah, now, maybe that's a little, uh, this now, will help them out. Um, it's mostly uh, uh, the, the battleship you, is used to bridge... Uh, fleets of Lokis and legions or bombers onto a target yeah bombers they have a really cool effect when they bridge it's uh it looks like lightning in the sky or a lightning ball uh very different from any other uh sino portal so you should check that out well let's read a little bit here uh they are i'll just read this as part of the Zenith Quadrant, and that's the quadrant that we're in now, that's the development quadrant, the new Rolling Thunder update goes live on September 22nd, providing a fresh balance pass for the new Edencom line of ships. That we forgot to mention, Edencom gets a damage boost, I believe. There will also be changes to the Galente and Minmitar Force Auxiliaries. That's another important change, Force Auxiliaries for Galente and Minmitar. Uh, I've heard that's going to affect wormholes pretty well. Plus yeah. Black Ops ships. Let me read this and then we'll come back to it. In addition to the ship changes, there will also be daily login rewards from September 25th through the 27th, including new unique skins for all three Edencom ships, as well as boosters designed to benefit the Vorton Projector weapons and free skill points. The Vorton Projectors are the weaponry specific to Edencom ships. So this is all about Edencom. Next paragraph, by increasing the amount of damage Edencom ships are able to inflict, they'll be better balanced generally. In addition, the DED loyalty point store uh, offers for Edencom items will have their costs reduced, making them more affordable across the board. So there's a little bonus. You can buy more with the stuff that you earn by flying missions for Edencom. And here's the last paragraph. Furthermore, all Black Ops ships are finally getting a fuel bay upgrade, and there will be improved resistance profiles for Black Ops battleships. I don't know why they say Black Ops ships here and then say Black Ops battleships here, since Black Ops are only battleships. Uh, last thing, uh, to complement the rolling Thunder update, Eve Online's new Eden store will offer 25% off the following skins from the 22nd to the 29th of September. And these look like uh, skins for the Life and the Panther, the Ninazu. Those are both faxes, the Life and the Ninazu, I believe. I don't know what Ninazu is. Do you know what it is? It's the Galante fax. It is, right? Okay. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the Redeemer and the Widow the Sin and the Marshall. Those are all Black Ops. So Black Ops and Faxes will get some skins. Specifically the two Fax that got uh, balance changes. Right. Galente and Minmitar. 
Now, have we looked at, I think we have, I haven't looked at uh, our talking and stations notes from our team, but what are some of the takeaways from the fax changes? Well, uh, the Leaf and Ninazu are generally a lot less favored in the current meta than uh, the Apostle and Minakawa. So these two ships that are uh, generally considered to be weaker, uh, they got a bonus to uh, the amount that of cap that they get from a cap booster. Right. That's added on to their, uh, their ship skill bonus. Okay. And the Black Ops are getting more resistance uh, on their profiles, but they're also getting a fuel bay. I don't remember if that was a big, big complaint. The major complaint and the reason a lot of Black Ops people that I know left the game was when Phoebe jump changes nerfed their ability to jump and then re-jump. Uh, they had the cooldowns were too punitive for Black Ops, which basically would spend an evening, you know, ambushing people. But if your if your timers uh, kept you from ambushing people, except every two or three hours, it wasn't worth sticking around. So their sessions basically dried up. You had one chance to do a drop. If it went well or didn't go well, that was it. You had to sit out for two hours, and a lot of them said, "Well, there goes my gameplay. I'm out of here." So that's when they took off. Although since then they have nerfed back Black Ops um, jump fatigue timers. So I don't know if that's an issue anymore. Yeah, I mentioned they, that because that's what I remember people leaving about. I don't remember the fuel bay being a big issue. Yeah, the fuel bay does. Uh, well, if you're uh, uh, bridging a cruiser fleet in particular, it can. can take a lot of stuff so you a blobs fleet will generally bridge a blockade runner as, as well to carry fuel for the bridger and the standard bridging ship is uh, a redeemer specifically because it has the most low slots that you can fit for cargo expanders to carry more fuel okay so some, I mean, obviously they made this change because they heard feedback from some of the people who were playing that. So we'll see how that works out. It'd be very interesting. I wonder if the pricing on those ships is going to go up. Should should take a look. They might be a lot of fun now. All right. So that's another big change. The Edencom ships getting uh, more damage. That's one of the chief complaints. Uh, the ships didn't have a stellar debut because they just were underpowered so this is an attempt to fix that and rather quick but it did takes a little bit of the fanfare out of flying Edencom ships so with more power we'll see what they end up doing i believe the criticism was they weren't really useful in abyssal space unless you were in a small window i think it was level three or four uh abyssal spaces uh and that was a, that was a problem so maybe they fixed yeah. it for that the Edencom ships, I didn't really, uh, uh, most of the criticism that I was hearing was there wasn't really a niche for them that they yeah. they could do well enough to be worth the, the considerably high cost of the ship and, and its modules and ammunition. And I think a 90% reduction in, uh, loyalty points, it, making it pretty much 10 times the, the weapon and ammunition 10 times cheaper pretty much is going to be the biggest uh the biggest change here because mm -hmm. of the main criticism seemed to be that it wasn't good enough to be worth being really expensive got it okay let's go into depths of the abyss uh we bring this up because it actually launched yesterday but today the tier 6 Abyssal space pockets are now open. They were delayed by one day. They are now live. So good luck in those. Those are incredibly rough. Okay, let's go to some player news. Yeah, one one more thing about oh, the sure. facts changes, yeah. though. I don't. I think that this is a step in the right direction if they want to put the Leaf and Nunazu on par with the other two, but. I don't really know if this is going to be enough to make people f consider these 
as valuable as the ones that are resist bonus. Okay. All right, let's go back to now the, uh, this is something I wanted to bring up. This is always something that people look at when they're talking about EVE Online. They want to know, if is this the game for them? Are there enough people in this virtual world to keep them around? And uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I do remember a time when CCP used to release this information publicly. Uh, and this is not uh, anything released by the company. So we don't know how, we do not know how accurate this is. I think they do talk about their methods, but as you can see, it starts tracking 2015. Uh, and around 2018 was, we had, we had massive wars happening in NullSec. So you can see the uh, accounts reached to a, about 525,000 players uh, in the game. That might be monthly economic, uh, monthly, logins or it might be uh well i don't really know what their statistic is but that's usually what gaming companies look for how often did a person log in during a day or how many people logged in during a day and how many people logged in during a month and so it gives you your very successive everyday login counts and and then your month is your longer trends so it's kind of like a market a five day versus a a 10 day but look here, this when this war started, it jumped right back up to 500,000 players. Uh, it's dipped off a little bit there, but uh, you know I think it's going to go back up as the war intensifies. So that's pretty good, and that's uh, we're kind of where we were in the last. At the, we're at the high point of the last five years, according to this chart, according to this website. Okay, I wanted to point out uh, a friend of ours, noisy gamer, made a. Uh, an article on his blog, Noisy, Nosy Gamer, blogspot.com. And this one is about the monthly economic report in July. And he does quite, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he does quite a uh, dive into statistics. Most of these are um, in game and meta type questions that he's trying to answer. In other words, he's looking at how the game is functioning how the game is functioning against bots, how the game is functioning against M RMT. These are the kinds of topics that he's interested in. Uh, and he ends up talking here about uh, the, the player economy and how it's doing since a year ago, blackout. Uh, so July is the right month to measure for that. And also if this war is registering economically yet, and uh, up to this point, if he's looking at July, it has not registered. That's the takeaway there. In more current news, I guess we could put this with war news, so we'll just move on to war news now. Another article that came out was The Rhetoric of War, uh, A Double-Edged Sword. This was published on INN by a horde pilot named Sierra Lucille. And uh, great artwork there again by Major Sniper. Major Sniper, by the way, is the CEO of a giant corporation in Goon Swarm. Uh, but he does a terrific job here of putting Vili's head and Matani's head on these uh, what well, look like uh, Eastern style painting. Looks looks really amazing. And the takeaway here is, is the rhetoric really helping? Uh, Matani's had some heated rhetoric, but so has Vili. And uh, is that consolidating their opponents or is that really um, raising the spirits of their allies? Uh, so I, I, don't, I think this article, from what I read, tries to write it from a perspective of a, a pox on both houses um, and uh, explores the idea of, of the overheated rhetoric. Is it really, is it really worth it basically? So you can check that out on Imperium news. Speaking of articles, uh, we helped and cooperated with an article, a big article that came out on Polygon and this article uh, written by a professional writer, um, was it was rather short, but it was made for an audience that is outside of EVE Online. So if you read it as a player of EVE Online, this may not work for you. But you can see by a lot of the comments uh, that people love reading about EVE Online, even though they don't dare play it because it's too complex. Uh, but they love reading the stories, and so a lot of the archetypes that this writer puts out um, would appeal to them. They could understand it. Uh, so, but it doesn't work necessarily 
for us. And I'll explain that in a second here. But this one's called EVE Online Players. EVE Online Player Gets Fired, Starts War to Exterminate His Old Boss. Again, that's supposed to appeal to non-players. Uh, and then the subtitle is, The Matani Calls for Reinforcements After Months Under Siege by a Former Employee. Now, we know in EVE Online that we don't really consider ourselves employees. We consider ourselves corp members. But technically, in the lore, capsuleers are employees of corporations. And the CEO of a corporation is the boss. So it technically works. It just, we've long departed thinking of ourselves as employees and bosses. So the article goes on to talk about uh, the backstory of this war. And it does a pretty good job uh, explaining World War B II, he calls it. And uh, both Matani and Billy are quoted in here, as well as uh, myself from Talking in Stations. And uh, it's not a very long article, but I think it's worth reading, just with a little grain of salt. Give the guy a break, you know, don't, uh, don't blast the comments saying you don't know anything about EVE Online, because the fact is he doesn't play EVE Online, but he's writing about it. He's fascinated with the stories, and he's writing for an audience that is also fascinated with the stories. And uh, what's interesting to me, the big takeaway here, is the strength of Vili's words saying he wants to exterminate uh, the Matani. Matani's reaction is to laugh right here. I guess that's a spoiler. <laughs> but uh, Vili definitely lays it out that he is, not, he is not looking for a surrender. This is all the way. This is all the marbles. And I, I believe him. Yeah. No, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I disagree with, uh, like in Sphinker there, says, uh, well, he should play EVE Online. Yeah, okay, maybe he should play EVE Online, but I don't think you have no right to write about EVE Online unless you play it. I think that's a terrible way of looking at it. There is, there are writers and there are news agencies like myself for people in the game. We interpret news and information the same way you do. We try to find information that's important to you and it, give it to you in a way that's important and younger players that are just learning but if you're a writer and you want to talk about eve online and try to translate that outside the game to non-players that's a powerful powerful thing because one of the one of the things that sets eve online apart from other games is the stories that come out and you do not want to do anything to stop those so uh, if it's not written for you, that's okay. It just It's just uh, imagine that that's a filter that, that blocks you from enjoying it. Um, but you should just see the comments and see how many people here and on the uh, tweets that went out about it, uh, people saying how much they love EVE Online stories. I think that's a big takeaway. Okay, so the origin of World War B2, written by a Polygon writer, uh, Charlie Hill, Charlie Hall, actually. And he wrote also about a um, um, huge event that happened a few weeks ago. Oh, I forgot. forgot that event, what it was called, uh, high sec event. Okay, so let's go look at some war. Oh, this is the big news. I buried the headline today. So that's all the articles and literature, but let's get into some of the harder news about uh, EVE Online. We're at like day 72. And we want to bring up this very important statement by Sister Bliss. This is basically the leader of initiative telling initiative what's next for them. And what do we find out? Do you know Gregorin? He's a... Uh, his announcement that I... I remember reading it after it got leaked last night uh, is that they are shifting their focus... Uh, uh, 1DQ is now going to be a jump clone deployment for them while they stage out of NPC Fountain. And, uh, and one of their goals with that is to uh, both get back to their roots uh, living out of NPC space and prevent other people from moving into Fountain even after they've been driven out. Yeah. Well, okay, so those are two major plot points 
Uh, one is, and I had been looking to see what the strategy would be for the initiative in Fountain. What were they up to? Reconquering the land was a nice uh, uh, show of force, but there wasn't really much force used because it was abandoned, essentially. So it doesn't mean that you're powerful. It means that you're capable. But what does it what does it mean in the long term? What are you trying to do with that territory? Are you going to repopulate it? Or are you going to build it back up right away? This is going to take 30 days at least before you can start to build bridges again and start to travel through it better. Uh, what's that strategy? Because in 30 days, Delve is going to be under a lot of pressure. So what are you going to do, Initiative? And here's the answer. The answer is they're going to patrol it and they're going to keep anybody from moving in. In other words, they're going to keep it warm. They're not moving into it right away, but they're going to make sure nobody moves into it. Uh, and they're going to harass anyone that tries to. But the second part of this, that they're going to make the campaign in Delve a clone campaign. That means that they aren't going to be there all the time. And we actually saw that just yesterday when there was a huge form up and I believe initiative only had 120 people there. I think they're capable of bringing more than that. And so was that a lack of will or was that a lack of planning or who knows? It looks like it was a lack of planning, not will. Uh, if they're going to be doing clone jumps for operations, uh, is the initiative going to become a less reliable ally in this war? An initiative is capable, so you want them there with uh, Goon Swarm and Bastion to fight off uh, Pappy forces. Um, and if you're just clone jumping down there, remember, you can only do that every 17 hours if you have skills uh, set to five. So that could be complicated. However, I'm sure if there's an emergency, you can just fly down uh, from Delve. It wouldn't take you that long. Um, so, yeah. yeah. My impression of the initiative is that they would prefer to be on the offensive and I think that this would be a good way to get onto the offensive, staging out of a an area where they can't really be permanently removed, and while and well, using that to to launch offensives against uh, somewhere like maybe the northern rental space, like uh, Tenal and Branch. Well, interestingly enough, their capital is under siege right now. Uh, the 49 Tech U is actually technically Initiative's capital. Now, I think that was a strategic capital placement. Really, they lived in Fountain, and they say they don't really like Sov. They just really uh, populated it just to make some money while they were there. Um, so they gave their capital city to 49 Tech, and that's what's under siege right now. So it's uh, it's... It's very interesting. I think um, I think this is not a turning point at all, but I do think this is a development. Now, I, I don't question Initiative's commitment, uh, but logistically, will this work? That's what remains to be seen. Will they be as flexible and in it day-to-day -day, <laughs> uh, as they need to be and what kind of pressure does this put on Goon Swarm? Because Initiative is a valued asset, valued ally. So uh, we try to get information from Sister Bliss, the leader. I was unable to contact him, but we'll look for some information to flush this out a bit more uh, in the future. Okay, let's wrap up with just a couple of kills that uh, happened today. This was the Prometheus. That's the Minmatar faction Fortazar. I believe it had original rigs. There it is. Upwell MR1 outpost rig. That means it's an original NPC station. Its location in UVHO TAC F Aquarius was its home for years. But now it is gone. That belonged to Goon Swarm. Also, we didn't cover this uh yesterday or we might have right as if we were going off air but this is the um for faction fortazar the dracos that is the amarian fortazar that was killed in h tac 4 rc r6z that's also in Quarius and belongs to goon swarm that one was knocked off yesterday and i believe that one was upwell standard outpost rig so these are two originals uh, which means that they were a little more valuable. These weren't traded to them by Sort Dragon. These were native to Aquarius. These were part of Goonswarm's conquering. 
So too bad. It makes me sad to see original rigs die because that means uh, a little piece of history died. These were historic stations. Well, it happens, especially during war. Uh, more to come tomorrow. There's a, a lot to look forward to in this uh, next few days and maybe this weekend as uh, the destiny of 49 Tech U is uh, in question. We will see how things shape up there. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Gorian, for coming around. We will see you tomorrow on TIS Today.